In the heart of South America, deep in the remaining mists and shadows of a lost world, a shaman in a drug-induced trance communicates with the spirit of a creature from our worst nightmares. Shaman sees visions and dreams dreams. And he prays for protection for his people as they journey through the forest. The jungle around him teems with potentially deadly animals. But the Piroa Indians revere one above all others. It's the largest and one of the most venomous spiders in the world, the giant tarantula. The Indian's respect is understandable. Everything about this spider is formidable. It has eight eyes, fangs two centimeters long, and legs which can comfortably span a dinner plate. It hunts on the ground mostly at night, during the day, it holds up beneath the forest floor, often taking over disused rodent burrows. The giant tarantula isn't the only fearsome creature to inhabit these parts. The fer de lance is one of the most venomous snakes in South America. Its poison causes paralysis, swiftly followed by the breakdown of the living tissue. Its immobilized victims suffer an agonizing death, then slowly dissolve from the inside out. The local remedy for this snake's bite is to amputate the affected limb immediately. Although the fer de lance will attack humans in self-defense, it usually preys on rodents occasionally cornering them underground. It's obviously looking for food. But there's no mere mouse down this burrow. The giant tarantula has the largest venom glands of any spider. There are no authenticated reports of anyone being bitten by one. Perhaps no one has lived to tell the tale. So no one knows just how venomous it is. Even so, the odds against a fight with a fer de lance seem stacked against the spider. In just four minutes, the snake twitches its tail for the last time. Giant tarantulas produce copious amounts of venom, curiously similar in effect to that of the snake and also causing tissue breakdown. As its victim slowly disintegrates, the spider sucks up the nutritious fluids through small mouth parts hidden beneath its fangs. Even the snake's backbone, already stripped of flesh, will eventually be partially digested and devoured.
a once deadly fang dangles limp and impotent. After 17 hours, all that remains of a formerly lethal snake is its shriveled skin. With a creature like this lurking unseen in the forest, it's not surprising the Piroa Indians seek spiritual guidance. A wax replica of a tarantula adorns the ceremonial headdress of a village shaman. While under the influence of Yopo, a hallucinatory drug, he communicates with the spider spirits, asking for their protection. The drug is made by grinding the seeds of a local tree. The active chemicals are absorbed through the nose. Soon the shaman will see visions. The shaman's lucky rock keeps his body anchored to this world, while his mind journeys through the spiritual universe. The Piaroa live in the central region of Venezuela, near the Colombian and Brazilian borders. This is the region of mists and lonely peaks, which inspired Conan Doyle to write his epic adventure story, The Lost World. It was a tale of savage tribes and prehistoric beasts, the area forms the northern extremity of the greatest forest on Earth, the Amazon jungle. Many Piaroa communities have been moved into modern settlements. The few who still live in the forest are some of the last Amerindians left unchanged by foreign influences. Next to their village, they cultivate a few crops but they do little damage to the surrounding jungle. The area is dotted with isolated and spectacular sandstone mountains, which the Piero are called Tepuis. The largest in the region rises over a thousand meters, almost vertically from the jungle below. It is sacred to the Piroa, and it features in many of their legends. They call it Wahari Kuwai. Thousands of years ago, a great tree laden with all the fruits of the forest grew here. The gods sent a boy to cut down the tree so that it would provide food for all men and beasts living in its shadow. When a greedy tapir ate more than its fair share, the gods turned both the tree and the beast to stone as a lesson to everyone. The Piroa heed the message from the gods. Their beliefs grew from the forest around them. This forest has changed little for centuries, so the Indians have had no need to change their way of life. The Piroa believe that the trumpeter bird was sent by the gods as a reward for their unwavering loyalty. These chicken-sized birds have taken to living round Indian settlements. In return for a few scraps, they help to rid the village of pests, especially snakes, even the fer de lance. The snakes have few enemies, but the trumpeter bird kills small ones. If the snake is too big to tackle, the bird's alarm calls alert the villagers to the danger. The snake's cryptic colouring confused the bird, and camouflage probably also saved this spider. 
even giant tarantulas are vulnerable to attack. Trumpeter birds have a negligible effect on the spider and snake populations. They may help control their numbers around the village, but the forest still teems with them. As the men prepare for a hunting expedition, they ask the shaman to bless them and pray for protection and success. The shaman's ceremonial headdress helps him to reach the god of the animal it represents. The effects of the drugs have not yet worn off, so he is still able to reach the spirits. The Pioroa hunt with blowpipes and poisoned darts. The forest supplies all the materials they need to make their weapons. The flights of the darts are fashioned out of wild cotton, and then the points are tipped with curare the substance which has become a byword for deadly poison. <laughs> Curare is made from the bark of a local vine. Once the sap has been extracted, it's gently warmed until it's thick and sticky like tar. The giant tarantula also originates in the jungle. It's molded out of a less dangerous substance, wild beeswax. The Piero regard the forest as their friend, but they know that all relationships require mutual respect. They cannot take without giving in return. The men may be away for three days, but they take only their weapons. The forest will provide for all their other needs. Although they are well armed, the hunters value the shaman's company to pacify the forest gods and bring them good fortune. Out of his trance, he's a skilled hunter too. Wild boar are highly prized but dangerous quarry. Their tusks are worn as lucky charms. The Pieroa hunt a wide variety of animals, including birds, deer, rodents, and monkeys. They are expert trackers who can move silently through the forest, stealthily creeping up on their prey and taking it by surprise. Of all the animals, they regard one, a very dangerous one, as a particular delicacy. But at first, they hunt less risky prey to supply the communal village cooking pots. Using a blowpipe over three meters in length requires a steady hand. The Indians are crack shots up to 50 meters.
The Piaroa are masterly climbers. A darted bird caught in the canopy is rarely lost. Curare is so potent that it kills almost instantaneously, causing a massive heart attack. The poison breaks down when it is boiled, so the birds can safely be eaten after cooking. Hunting requires courage as well as skill. Venomous animals lurk unseen throughout the forest, and every year some Indians die from bites and stings. But no one has ever been killed by a giant tarantula. Yet. The Piaroa believe their faith keeps them safe and that the spirits have shown the spiders how to stay out of their way. Each spider leaves a silken network of trails crisscrossing its territory, which it may use like a map to guide it. It also lays several strands of silk radiating out from the entrance of its burrow, specifically to detect the approach of both enemies and prey. The trap set, the spider retreats underground to lie in wait for unsuspecting victims. But its defences are not infallible. Even venomous spiders have their enemies. Like many creatures in this lost world, the tarantula hawk wasp has grown to giant proportions. It's evolved into a winged demon the size of a man's hand. The wasp hunts giant tarantulas not to eat, but as a host for its eggs. First, it must lure the spider from out of its lair. It walks over the invisible silk fan on the spider's doorstep. It's like deliberately setting off a booby trap. It then attempts to sting and paralyze the spider, attacking its soft underparts. Once the spider has been immobilized, the wasp will entomb it in its own burrow, where the tarantula will gradually be eaten alive by the wasp's grub developing inside it. Surprise and speed are the key to success. This wasp badly misjudged its attack, allowing the spider to strike first. It retreats mortally wounded. In April, the rain start. For the next five months, the area will be deluged several times a day. Once dry creeks turn into torrents, when they burst their banks, they flood the forest. Giant tarantulas live in dry burrows above the flood level, but are most active during the wet season. The Piaroa are well aware that the spiders come out after a storm, and they know exactly where to find them. The hunters hide their catch out of the reach of scavengers like foxes or wild cats for collection later. The chances of stepping on a spider are higher during the rainy season than at any other time of year. Since the spiders emerge mainly after dark, the hunters set up camp just before nightfall. They have journeyed far into the jungle, but their search is not over yet. While giant tarantulas live on dry ground, several of their tree-living relatives live in the flooded forest. Orchids grow on trees, but unlike parasitic plants, they only use their host plant for support and take no nourishment from it.
Few biologists have ventured this far into the Amazon forest, so many of the tarantulas which live here are unknown to science. This species has yet to be classified and named. The orchid's tangled root system provides tree-living tarantulas like this bird-eating spider with an ideal daytime retreat. Despite their name, bird-eating spiders rarely catch feathered prey. Instead, they feed mainly on insects which they hunt at night. The giant tarantula attacks a much wider and larger range of prey, but it too feeds predominantly on insects, mainly because they are more abundant than any other food. The movements of a potential victim above ground travel as vibrations along the silk threads leading to the burrow. The sensitive hairs on the spider's legs can detect the smallest quiver. Tarantulas sometimes go on the prowl, but generally they wait near their burrow entrance for potential victims to come within pouncing distance. The tarantula's technique for dining on its victim is as gruesome and leisurely as the kill was clean and swift. To avoid attracting the attention of ants and potential enemies, the giant tarantula takes its victim down its burrow. There are few animals which will risk following this spider a meter on the ground. The giant tarantula covers the floor of its lair with a silk mat. This helps to keep it clean and stops ants from invading the chamber. It also forms the base of a silk cocoon which will eventually encase its victim like a mummy. The spider spins several strands at the same time, which it drapes over the locust, attaching the loose ends to the floor. As the spider injects more venom, the internal tissues rapidly break down. A tight silk shroud stops the insect's body from falling apart as it is sucked dry. Giant tarantulas keep themselves and their layers meticulously clean to prevent contamination by fungi and bacteria and to avoid attracting scavenging ants. This shriveled pellet, all that remains of the locust, will be removed before daybreak. Under cover of darkness, the giant tarantula leaves its lair to search for more prey. It's safe to hunt for the rest of the night as its greatest enemy is only active during the day.
The Amazon jungle is home to the world's biggest snake, as well as the largest venomous spider. Both species are giants, larger-than-life monsters from the real lost world. The anaconda, which can grow to a length of 10 meters, hunts in rivers and relies on the water to support its weight. The spider needs a constant supply of water to replace body fluids partly used up by producing venom. The Pierreux fear the anaconda as much as the giant tarantula. But during the rainy season when the forest is flooded, they are forced to join the snake in its element. The men watch their step. The anaconda will not attack unless provoked. It is non-venomous, but it does have a painful bite. Deep puncture wounds can go septic with fatal consequences. The forest provides many natural remedies, but the Pieroa have no antibiotics. The anaconda is one fitting denizen of this lost world. The hoetzin is another. Like a relic from the past, it shares a primitive feature with prehistoric birds. Unlike most tree-nesting birds, hoetzin chicks first leave their nest at about a week old, long before they have fledged. Most chicks would soon crash to the ground and fall victim to predators, but the hoetzin hatches with rudimentary claws on its wings. The chicks use the claws to clamber about the branches. Wing claws are also found on the pterodactyl, an unpleasant character encountered by the adventurers to the fictitious lost world. There's nothing menacing about the hoetzin. It's strictly vegetarian, feeding on fruit, flowers and leaves. Here in the Amazon forest, the bird is surrounded by a superabundance of food. The Hoetzin is superbly adapted to life in the flooded forest. The chicks can swim from a few days old, and with those wing claws, they're quite capable of clambering back up into their nests. The Amerindians occasionally collect Hoetzin eggs, limiting the harvest to one from each nest but they seldom hunt the adults. They call them stink birds because they smell musty, so they concentrate their main efforts on more palatable prey. The Pieroa know and understand the balance between the forest's dangers and its gifts. They hunt coates, but this South American relative of the raccoon has sharp senses and is difficult to catch. The 
The coati uses its long, sensitive snout to root for fruit, insects, reptiles, amphibians, and spiders. This animal is a youngster that has never encountered a giant tarantula before. It's in for an unpleasant surprise. The spider rears up to look as intimidating as possible. If this doesn't work, it will bring spines on its rear legs and specialized hairs on its abdomen into action. A remarkable defense mechanism which stops most enemies in their tracks. The spider makes a hissing sound, like a snake, as further warning. But the coati is not deterred. Each tarantula has over a million abdominal hairs, which are tipped with barbs. A single stroke with a back leg releases thousands of hairs into the air. When inhaled, they cause a fierce burning sensation. The pain will ease after several hours, but it's a lesson learned. This young coati will grow up with a healthy fear of giant tarantulas. It will probably never tackle one again. The giant tarantula has a formidable array of defense mechanisms, but it is really a mild-natured creature which will only attack if provoked. It's not easy to see a spider in the undergrowth, even when it's an outsized one. But with the shaman as company, the men feel safe and continue to hunt in the forest. It's not just ground-dwelling creepy crawlies the men have to look out for. Danger lurks in the waterways, in the undergrowth, and in the trees above. This bird-eating spider's bite is no worse than a bee sting. It eats insects, but it's not after the damselfly. Something else has alarmed it. There are many venomous snakes in the forest, but an emerald tree boa is harmless. It doesn't eat tarantulas, but the spider reacts instinctively to movement and takes evasive action. Landing in midstream is no problem, because it can walk on water. Its numerous hairs act as floats, and its legs make effective paddles. The Pierroa avoid all the spiders around them, except for the most dangerous one. It may seem foolhardy, but they actually regard the giant tarantula as one of the greatest gifts the forest provides. And as children, they learn exactly where to find them and how to entice them from their lairs. They know that tarantulas respond to vibrations and they are experts at imitating the jerky movements of a struggling insect with a piece of vine. But the spider isn't easily fooled. If it feels threatened, it'll respond with a shower of hairs. It's enough to make the hunter back off, but only temporarily. When he has lured the spider some distance from its burrow, the hunter pins it to the ground with two fingers. 
and then cautiously gathers up all eight legs. He's careful not to touch the abdomen and to keep his fingers well out of range of those needle-sharp fangs. Giant tarantulas are carried live in a string of neat little parcels. A leaf serves as wrapping paper. Before he ties up the spider with a vine stem, he gently blows away any loose abdominal hairs. The hunting party stops for lunch at an ancient burial ground. For countless generations, it's been regarded as a special place. Like their ancestors before them, the Pieroa still make fire the hard way. It'll take about five minutes of strenuous labor to generate the first glow of fire. The rock art is believed to be over 3,000 years old. There's evidence of spidery shapes, but the symbolism of many of the drawings remains a mystery. Entombed in the rock, the bones of ancestors and recently departed relatives lie side by side, laid to rest in a horizontal crevice at the base of the cliff. The spirits have been kind and the hunting good. The men prepare to feast on a favorite food, spiders. They regard them as a delicacy, but take no more than they need. A couple of tarantulas each will sustain them until they return to the village. Pierreur kill tarantulas just before they cook them, as they like to eat them as fresh as possible. They handle them with extreme caution. Only when they're dead will the Indians hold them. And even then, they won't touch the abdomen. Females heavy with eggs are a special treat. Each one yields about 70 to 80 eggs. When roasted over the coals, they make a bitter tasting omelet. The hunters barbecue the spider's legs on the fire, singeing off the hairs over the flames. Mm -hmm. 
Patting gets rid of any remaining charred hairs. They regard the thorax and legs as the best bits. Apparently, they taste very similar to prawns. To the Pieroa, spiders, eggs and meat are the equivalent of caviar and shellfish. The spiders are a gift from the gods. When we fail to catch other food, we can usually find spiders. We know they are dangerous, but as long as we respect their spirits, we will not get bitten. They are good food and they are delicious. At the end of the meal, all that's left are the fangs. And even they aren't wasted. They must be the world's most exotic toothpick. For the thousands of spiders which escape the hunters, the danger isn't over yet. Almost more strange than a spider barbecue is the spider's behavior towards each other. The biggest threat a male giant tarantula has to face is the female of the species. The male giant tarantula's main purpose in life is to find receptive females and fertilize them. The male approaches a female's burrow with extreme caution. Tarantulas are not immune to their own venom, and a wrong move at any time in the courtship could prove fatal. He gently taps the female, testing for her reaction. The trick seems to be to stroke her into a trance. Next, he will gently lift her up in order to reach the sexual organs on the underside of her body. It's a procedure that cannot be hurried. The male is in an extremely vulnerable position. This one made a move too soon and was lucky to survive his mistake. The male's objective is to transfer sperm, which he carries in small brown silken sacks, to the female without being eaten during the procedure. The whole process is fascinating. The build-up to mating can take up to two hours, with the male making several failed attempts. But once he has maneuvered the female into a suitable position, he feels for her reproductive opening. Then he releases his sperm, first from one palp, then the other. Once he has fertilized her, he must gently put her down and then make a rapid exit before she regains her senses and tries to attack him.
Males reach sexual maturity at about three years old and die soon afterwards. But females can live for 20 years. The spider's future seemed safe in the hands of the Pieroa, but it may not be up to them anymore. Already, collectors from the West are paying big prices for the latest bizarre pet, a giant tarantula. The Pieroa limit their harvest of females with eggs to make sure they do not harm the spider population. Preserving the wildlife around them is essential for the well-being of future generations of their tribe. When I take Yopo, I see evil powers trying to steal the spiders from us. I pray to the spirits to drive these demons away. One day soon, I must teach the children of the village to take Yopo, so that when I die, at least one will take over from me and take care of the tarantulas. I speak to the spirits of the spider and ask them to make the tarantulas fertile so that they will multiply and provide food for us. Each female produces between 70 to 80 large eggs which she wraps with silk into a ball the size of a lemon. About 80 days after the eggs were laid, the spiderlings hatch inside the egg case. It will take them another 24 hours or so to break out of their cocoon. For a few days after emerging, they stay in their mother's burrow living off the last of their yolk reserves. The female's responsibility is now over. Her burrow offers the babies some security, but she does not provide them with food. Hunger will eventually force them to take their first steps into the forest alone. Surrounded by a natural world containing such fearsome creatures, the Pieroa have evolved a religion which aims to persuade the spirits of the forest onto their side. If it were left to them, practical conservation linked with spiritual guidance could ensure the survival of the giant tarantula. <laughs>